The world of e-commerce can be tricky, and that's why you need the experts to help take you to the next level. This is Delivering E-Commerce, and this is Chris Parsons. Welcome to Delivering E-Commerce. I'm your host, Chris Parsons, and I have a very special guest today, Erica M. Erica, thank you for this opportunity. I greatly appreciate you being part of me just launching uh, Delivering E-Commerce. It's only been going for uh, just over three weeks now. I'm having a great time, and having you on here, I, I know I've made a ton of people jealous. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> My pleasure, and I think we're going to have an amazing conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Brilliant. So I would start off always asking my guests if they can tell their story and how, you know, how your journey has brought to you, brought you where you are today. So if we can start there, would love for our audience to be able to listen to, you know, you starting where you started and coming all the way to here and what made you make different decisions. I mean, I looked at the your ericam.com website and your history, and it's so inspiring to watch the different chances and different initiatives that you just said, you know what, I'm going to dive into this and do that. And I'm simplifying it, of course. But when I watch those those mom moments in your history to be able to say, I'm going to go a little bit different direction, it's it's inspiring. So I would love for everyone to hear that that journey. So what you're asking is actually a really long answer. And if we have about seven hours, I could probably get through <laughs> half of it. Uh, I've lived a really full life or am living a really full life. And so I, I am full of stories. I think maybe you know, it'd be fun is for me to tell you the story that changed my life. I love the, that. Something that happened to me when I was quite young and because of pizza, um, I am where I am today and I'll tell you why. I was around eight years old, came home from school. Mom, I'm starving. Mom order pizza. And my mom said, sure, we can have pizza, but tonight you're going to order it. And I was like, yeah, mom, I'm eight. That's not going to happen. It's your job. You're the mom. You're ordering the pizza. And my mom said, well, actually, no. Today, you're ordering the pizza. So I stormed upstairs because she was absolutely wrong. I was not going to order the pizza. And two hours later, I said, mom, did you order the pizza yet? She said, no, did you? Okay, I was start. Chris, this is like unfair, right? I'm starving. Go downstairs. I said, Mom, seriously, I'm eight. I'm starving. She said, order the pizza. You felt like it was child abuse, right? So I called. Hi, I'd like to order pizza, please. What would you like on it? Extra cheese, please. Fine, 30 minutes or it's free. So you know what happened? 30 minutes later, the pizza arrived and I was devouring and I was starving. Right. And my mom said, so what did we learn here? I said, pizza's awesome. <laughs> she said, no, you need to be able to ask for what you want. And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? But that really, it did stick with me. Cause she said to me, listen, what's the worst case situation? Let's say the pizza dude hung up on you because you were you know, only eight and you have a little squeaky voice and he didn't take you seriously, what would happen? And I'd say, then I wouldn't get pizza. She said, wrong. You will call another pizza dude and you will get pizza from somewhere else. Someone who appreciates the fact that you had the courage to call when you were eight years old. Really, that has been the basis of my success. Not just in ordering pizza, Chris, because mm -hmm. I do that quite well, but everything in my life has happened because I have had the, my mother's words sort of ringing in my ears, don't be afraid to ask, what's the worst that could happen? And yes, I got my job on Much Music because I asked. Every job I've had, I've asked. I probably have asked you to advertise mm -hmm. with YMC, am I right? Did yep. I not hit you up, yep. it's, right? Did you yep. say yes? Yes, I did. You did not. I did oh, wait, too. Wait, wait, what was it for? It wasn't I believe for, we did it with um, with Newegg as we were trying to right. acquire right. some female audience because we had the traditional male shopper with with Newegg and it was just so stereotypical and I knew that you know women are smart and they have uh, electronics needs just like anyone else so why wouldn't we advertise to them mm -hmm. and you had curated such a great audience of these powerful women that I wanted to make sure we were tapping into that market and 
and we did a, a small partnership. I mean, I, it wasn't a big campaign, but um, ultimately we, we knew it was the right thing to do to start broadening. Um, I mean, let's face it, most females control the spend at home anyways. So it was great to get their their uh, involvement with our brand. So oh, Chris, you are a wise man. But <laughs> the point the point of this of my of my asking you and embarrassing you on your own podcast was because I am still to this day fearlessly asking for what I want. And you know, hopefully, if there's anything that anybody takes away from this podcast, although they're going to listen to the next two hours where we're going to talk, yeah. um, really, that's the thing to ask yeah. for what you want and question yourself. If you're afraid to ask, what are you so afraid of? Right. To hear no. And that's a, it's a no, it's not, a you will get thing. no, you will get no. I get no all the time. Yeah. Look, I'm in sales. I run an, I run a marketing agency and I'm looking for clients all the time. I get no all the time and I survive. I'm okay. I get, you know, so I just pick myself up and then I ask someone else and eventually someone says yes. And the fact that someone says no to me, by the way, doesn't mean that that what my offering is isn't great, which it is. Yeah. It's that they don't have a need for it or they don't understand the value yet. And it's my job to explain to them why I bring value to what they're looking for. Yeah, I love that. And especially the aspect of, you know, when people do say no, a lot of times they still need your service. It's just we need to tell a better story. Um, and maybe we didn't understand their hot buttons or understand what their needs were at the specific time. And if we go back a few months later after doing some more research or really diving into their business, and then we tell that story over again with a little bit more personalization to how it benefits them, you will get that yes. I believe that every time you ask yeah. is actually the beginning of a conversation. It's the beginning of a relationship. So when you ask someone, to do something or for something, if they respond with a no, you could say, okay, cool. Can I ask why? Or would you mind if I reached out again with another opportunity or, hey, how's your day going? <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is. And those of us who can handle that sort of initial negative feedback or answer and understand it's not about you, meaning it's not about us, and we have that ability to sort of pivot quickly and turn that sort of negative thing into an opportunity, we're the ones who succeed. Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, I, I had to send a LinkedIn message to you, hope and a prayer to say, Erica, would you do me the honor of being on my podcast? And it, I could have just said, no, she's going to say no and moved on to, you know, the typical e-commerce guys in the industry. And while they'll bring great value to the conversations and dialogue, I wanted to reach out to you specifically because I knew of the value of content. You and I have, and you may not know this, but when I speak about e-commerce, I speak of the three C's of commerce quite a lot. And that's content, community, and then commerce, where in our industry, so many people jump to the process of building a website and think they're going to sell, but they have done nothing to add value to that consumer shopping journey. So they're not putting effort into the content or making it unique or uh, allowing a consumer to really understand their service and the benefits of it. And then they do nothing to curate that community aspect where they'll spend a ton of dollars trying to get people to, to buy from them, but they're not showing that customer why we should be an advocate of that brand. And when I watch the work that you do, I'm like, I'm just blown away because you are definitely content driven, content first strategy. And, and that's where I really want to touch on some of your journey is, is where, where did you just, did it just come natural to you? Or was it from the much music experience and, mm -hmm. you know, watching them curate content to drive people to the channel all the time? Where did that come from with you? First of all, I want to say that what you just said is very powerful. The piece about building a relationship with your clients or your potential customers is an art and people want to buy from people who they like. Right. And if you build a relationship with someone, then they'll stay with you to some degree. Because if the price is the same at two different places, why not give your business to someone who kind of values you, right? Yep, 100%. So um, 
I really respect what you said. And I, I kind of think that in a way, what you're saying is a dying skill. I think people are spending so much money on algorithms mm -hmm. and buying people's eyeballs that they are forgetting that key emotional piece, which I think is more valuable than your paid media. Right. I agreed. And we, we spend in retail a lot of money trying to save a customer after a poor experience. And I'm saying, why don't we take those dollars and invest up front to improve that experience, to make them feel valued with us trying to win back a customer after they've had a poor experience versus everyone's going to have a poor experience no matter how good of a job you do because there's always miscommunications. But if you've curated that environment over a period of time, that consumer is going to understand that these bumps happen and stay with you as a shopper. But if you're just giving them a gift card to win them back, they'll spend that gift card, but they're not coming back. A gift card is just um, a nice way to try to appease someone, but it's not, it's not showing that you care and you want to have them as a long, like I always refer to the lifetime value of a customer versus the one purchase. And I, I think we need to, in this industry, put more time and energy in making sure you're valued as a consumer versus when you're trying to leave. And I think, you know, I don't want to name a specific retailer, but my telco company only ever appreciates me when I leave. <laughs> when I'm when I'm there and I'm paying my bills on time, they're giving better deals out day in and day out to new customers to acquire them versus how do they reward me for being with them for 80, eight years? 100%, totally agree with that. Um, yeah, for me, I think marketing is about relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what you're speaking about. The content that we create is not about us or not like we do a lot of, like we're a marketing agency. So we work with brands and we help tell the brand story to moms. But the thing is, it's not about the brand. It's about what can the brand bring to moms that is a value. Right. So, you know, sometimes when we, create sponsored content, the brand says, but you're hardly even talking about us. And I go, yeah, we don't need to talk about you. We need to talk about what you bring. You yeah. need, we need to talk about, about the moms, not about you. You need to say to the moms, we see you, we understand what you need. We want to be there. We're here to service you. How can we help? And I think that this sort of constant push who wants to listen to a loudmouth who's always talking about themselves right as opposed to a friend who says you're going through a hard time now aren't you moms i get it how can we help you wow you how care can we add value to your experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely that's great. you know when i think about home hardware funny mm -hmm. enough that is a brand that is humanized all the marketing, all the advertising of the people who work in the stores, these imperfect people who look like me, who are part of the fabric of my community, where do you want to spend your money? At some big US national big box store that has no soul or the mom and pop shop down the street that has the exact same products, but they're here for you. We are here for you. To me, it's a no brainer. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that store of the community um, presence, um, the locally made when you have an opportunity, I'm sure you might pay a little bit of a premium for the quality and for to support your community, but it goes a long way because things go in, in cycles. And if if you can shop locally, you know, it increases the, the economy, it helps manufacturers locally, it helps, it, help, it has a, such a trickle effect that we don't think of at the time of purchase because we're just thinking about that price on that product. But if we if we have to actually step back and we're like, okay, it's a 20% premium, but that 20% in my community helps so many things. And you know, there's even retailers that do a lot of giving back in the community. Mm. And if, if you spent more with them, they would even do more in the community. Yeah, but I will say though, I am a consumer as well mm -hmm. as a marketer. And 20% is, is a big jump for me to make if I can get it cheaper down the road. You need to be, you as a, the local retailer, need to be giving me so much added value 
for me to want to spend 20% more. So are retailers ready to do that? Well, I think so 20% on a $200 purchase is, is significant on a, on a $10 purchase and 20%. If, if I'm walking in and I'm able to get good service and good product knowledge from an associate and they're able to make thoughtful recommendations so I leave with one package mm. versus multiple trips, to me that 20% becomes valuable because I'm not spending the gas money, I'm not spending the extra trips coming back and forth. So if I can get that type of complete holistic service, um, I, I am willing to pay a little bit of a premium. But again, I'm in my 40s now and I get to <laughs> be, be lucky with a, a decent income in life versus others that that 20%, you know what, uh, I may so just say I want I'm to get product. Let me uh, give you an example of, it's not actually a retailer, it's a specific um, location of a retailer. Mm -hmm. In my neighborhood, there's a Metro um, supermarket that I used to go to all the time. It's a little bit far from my house, but it's got a good parking lot. So that's valuable for me. I like it. It, you know, I like the layout, etc. But there was a man named Tom Sand Tom Sanders, who was the general manager there. Mm -hmm. This guy was unbelievable. He would walk around the store every day. He knew customers' names. Who does that anymore? Right. He knew. He knew my name. Now I'm famous, so okay, it's not a great example, but I would watch him because I'm in the business. I was curious, like, who is this man? He would walk around to people and he always had little coupons that he printed out for like a dollar off, $2 off at the cash. And he'd sort of take one or two and he pushed them into my hand. He says, you know, go take this. This is for you. He'd give me like $2 off. It meant so much to me. I would drive there in a snowstorm to shop at that metro. I wouldn't go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. He died. He died. And the, in, the, our, I live in Toronto, the heartless city of Toronto. The whole neighborhood was in tears. He died of a heart attack. He worked one night, went home, and he died in his sleep. There's a plaque of him in the, in the front of the store. Mm -hmm. And no one has ever come close to this incredible man who ran a supermarket. Yeah. Now, that doesn't always come with like huge accolades. This guy, I had the most respect for him. He was incredible at his job. Yeah, I love the power that. Of, I talk about micro influencers and leveraging a lot of retailers want to go out and spend dollars finding an influencer. But this example is an influencer who who's already employed by you and he's touching the community in big ways. And where I really really think retail needs to go is how do we empower these associates to have those connections and relationships? Because um, I, I think that's more important. And, and I'm not taking away from a YouTube influencer who's doing a great job and educating people and doing the unboxing and giving product knowledge. But God, there's got to be a way for us to really value our associates and know that these are the relationships that they build. We may not see it in our offices here because we're planning all the marketing stuff. But it's those people on the sales floor that are really con connecting with the consumers that we need to empower. Well, here's the thing. If you have uh, an employee who goes above and beyond the typical, you know, stone faced pack your bag or whatever it is, which is what is usually happening, happening now in yeah. big box stores. What happens if they are like Tom, then I get an experience. I build a relationship and I become a deep committed fan of that store. I mean, I still to this day, I'm loyal to that location, even though Tom isn't there anymore. And I wonder when I go to all these big box stores, why is everyone such a miserable jerk? Right. And I'm not calling out, you know, specific. It's like every store, it's the same. It's like they don't want to be there. They're peons. They, they're, they're basically there because they need to get paid. Yep. And so they do this job. And there is 
such an opportunity. You're right, Chris, for this sort of co corporate culture to, inf it takes time, it takes effort. And you're right, this is the kind of sort of hidden cost that on the surface is like, well, we're not gonna waste our money you know, taking our, or, or, or training our staff to be like great people and to be inspired and like people at Apple apparently are, yeah. they do that, do that thing there. But I believe that it would pay off, like you're saying, that people will only, man, do you know what happens when you go to that store? They actually, you know, the keg, they sing you a song. Okay, that's a great example, the keg. I'm one of their super fans. They know it already yeah. because I talk about them, yeah. even though usually I get paid to talk about brands. My daughter has allergies. Every time we go to the keg, and it's not just me, again, yeah. it's anyone who walks in with an allergies, they have a manager comes, spends 10 minutes with them, learns about their allergies, goes into the kitchen, comes back, they go back and forth. They are so careful and personal about mm -hmm. it. When you go to the keg, you get an experience. You feel like you're a king and a queen when you go to the keg. And it's no more expensive than any other restaurant, but the staff there are amazing. They're different than any other restaurant I've been to. I think when I go to the keg, they operate as a team. They're like, they're a family. And yes. you see that they have that pride and that consistency on how they serve customers versus just in retail, a lot of times, I don't think that students realize the opportunity they have when they have a retail job, because you may start as a as someone that's stocking shelves, like I did at Future Shop and Mario No Frills as a kid. But the opportunity in retail to grow a career is what is not translating. And I think that's why associates seem so disengaged, because they don't see how they can learn, okay, I'm going to front face items, I'm going to learn about end caps, I'm going to learn about how a customer shops and, and walks the floor and then translate that into maybe a new job at the home office. Maybe it's an analytical role or marketing. But that's role. not the kid's they, fault or the student's no. fault. That's management. hundred percent. That's the inspiration. And that's where I was going to come back to. Did when Tom passed away, did, did he leave any of his DNA at that store? And did, does that experience and that culture, did that manifest or did it, did it leave with him? Unfortunately. It mostly left with him. It's, it's, uh, it, it's incredible the effect he had, especially when you see what it's like there now. It's fine. Right. It's like a regular supermarket, but there's very little personal touch now. The characters aren't there anymore. Like it's mm -hmm. just become a little more like big box. Right. Where they're just, you're a customer. We need to yeah. com complete this transaction and yeah. We'll see you in a week when you come in for your next purchase. And not only that, not only will we complete the transaction, but please go into the self-checkout so you don't even have to talk to anybody anymore. <laughs> I, I laugh at that because I'm like, shouldn't I get a discount when I go into a self-checkout because now I'm doing the work? But anyways, we can have a whole discussion on that. <laughs> it, but think it, about I, that. I, what, I, a, what a smart thing to do. Like, why don't retailers think about those kinds of surprise and delights. Mm -hmm. What can you give anything small, like that little $2 crumpled little handmade coupon that Tom would squish into my hand like, like uh, my grandmother used to do. Yeah. It meant so much to me. Big yeah, smile on his face. Here, Erica, this is for you. Yeah. And did, were you familiar with the company Zappos? Uh, um, they're, I think, a they were key on yes. doing stuff like this, like sending Surprise flowers to someone delight. on their anniversaries, mm -hmm. sending handwritten notes to a consumer. Like that, that they were top notch when they were, I think they're owned by Amazon now, but when they were on their <laughs> own, um, they, they were very powerful from that perspective. You know, it's funny because um, my job, my agency mm -hmm. connects moms with brands. And so we're always coming up with unique ideas where the brand can surprise the mom or sort of touch the mom in, in some way. And most of them end up not doing it because they don't see the value in it. Right. You obviously, you do, I do. I understand that if you do this surprise and delight, that people will just go, oh my God, they're human. 
actually the other day was so funny. I showed a picture of, um, on Twitter, I showed a picture of what my kids made for me for Mother's Day, which was a hot dog on white bread rolled up over a barbecue, uh, over our, um, our fire at our yeah. fire pit. And, you know, I was getting all kinds of like funny comments. And then um, Heinz commented, because he's like, where's the ketchup? <laughs> and I was like, I didn't respond because I don't like ketchup. <laughs> and I didn't <laughs> want to make the person from who's running the Twitter handle for Heinz to look bad because I thought it was so awesome that they engaged as as a person. Yeah. So I, I I couldn't come up with something funny, and so I I just didn't say anything. But I thought it was fantastic that they someone did that. Yeah, the, to interject into your and not be salesy, but to be clever and have a personality. Um, I mean, that's what makes us Canadian, though. I think a lot of Canadians are able to interject and have that little bit of wit and sarcasm in 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 their dialogues. And I do appreciate that when I'm on different social medias, you can see the difference between a a big brand out of the US that's so curated and so, I don't wanna say restricted, but I mean, everyone is so sensitive these days on you mm -hmm. know, where's that line and I don't wanna cross it, but um, there's something very authentic about just interjecting with a little joke like that is where, where's the catch? Well, it is authentic because yeah. it's not scripted. It's responding, being, being proactively responding and jumping into a conversation with a consumer is, is so smart. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Hey, I'm going to take us a little bit different path right now. I wanted to ask you the question about, so in my career, I've had many times where I've, I've not fail. I hate using that word, but I, I struggle with where I've had opportunities that didn't go as planned. Um, whether that's leaving a certain company or I uh, put in a gift registry that only lasted a few months in, into Walmart. And it's a long story, but uh, <laughs> I learned I needed to ask more questions in, in development stages. Um, I just so many opportunities where I've had to uh, learn from my mistakes mm. in, in your career. Is there a couple of moments that you can highlight or one that just stands out that while it was something maybe earth shattering at that time to you personally, but actually empowered you and made you stronger after going through it? Yes. Um, my mom was very ill. Um, she had cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I hired a man to run my business so that I could care for my mom. And he ran the company for a couple of years. I didn't agree with everything he did, but you know, when you hire someone, it's, you don't want to be micromanaging them. And uh, my mom passed away. When I took the company back, it was in tatters. What did I learn? If someone doesn't have the same sort of instincts as you do, so for me, it's about relationships. For him, it was the bottom line. Right. He comes from an, with an MBA and like, you know, all the Mr. I'm big business. I come with, we need to connect with our audience. We need to connect with our clients. We need to be creative. We need to think differently. He's like, no, we need to upsell people. We need, you know, like it's a completely yeah. different language and it almost killed my business. So what, what did I learn from it? Well, I knew what I was doing right. and I still know what I'm doing. And I would say that it's not about the bottom line. The bottom line comes from building relationships and staying true to your ideals, the values of the company, your sense of purpose, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I mean, to have that confidence in yourself and, and go through that, I dealt with something similar when I left Walmart. Um, I didn't leave because I wanted to. I actually loved working for Walmart. It was some of the best education in my retail business I've ever had. And um, it was the first website I ever launched. And I was so nervous about, did I launch it successfully because it was Walmart and it had, you know, 10 million flyers going out to market and it had this 90% of all shoppers shop there. So was I successful because of Walmart or was I successful because I knew what I was doing? And then I went to go to a new company and launch their website and the sense of fulfillment and gratification I had for going to a smaller company mm. and be able to launch that gave me so much confidence in myself that I, if I stayed with Walmart, I would have never had that moment to, to inspire me in myself or 
bet on myself again because I, I, I just would have wouldn't have had that learning experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I try to tell that story quite often because so many people, when a bad situation happens, they they are devastated. And I was I I remember driving over to Tim Hortons and sitting there <laughs> and being devastated, like what am I going to do in my career next? And then all of a sudden, I had a job within the next day. What? And yeah. What, wait, you, you're leaving out a little bit there. How does it yeah. all of a sudden? What happened? Did you apply for a job or? No. What? Um. So Terry from the Toronto Star, Terry Colquhoun, was running um, at the time um, Metroland, and um, him and I were. I helped him with a site that used to be called Flyerland, is now called Save.ca. Yes. And I had a meeting with him at ten in the morning uh, when I was at Walmart. After I left, I wasn't there, obviously, for my meeting. I went over to Tim Hortons. I cried in my coffee. And um, Terry called me and he said, where are you? You're supposed to be at, um, at this meeting. And I said, Terry, I said, unfortunately, um, things didn't work out. And, and they didn't. And all of a sudden, Terry was like, well, I'm looking for an e-commerce guy to help me with Flyerland. And you had a lot of input in it over the course of the years because of the relationship with Walmart. He's like, come in for an interview and the next day I was hired. So wow, um, it was, that's a great it, story. Yeah. It's, and this is where I think LinkedIn and the networking and, you know, you and I haven't done a lot of business together, but I know we've shared, Hey, congratulations on, on a, a job or whatever, whatever little note it was just to stay connected and interacting. And that networking is so important. I think people miss out on that when they stay within their bubble versus you know, just reaching out and curating that relationship. I think it's interesting as we're talking, there seems to be a theme that's running through sort of ironically considering we're talking e-commerce, which is, mm -hmm. you know, sort of a digital cold medium. But the only thing that you and I have been talking about is relationships. Yeah. We're talking about relationships <clears throat> amongst your peers for networking. We're talking about relationships with retailers and their consumers in the stores. We're talking about relationships with brands and uh, consumers online. And no matter what conversation we're having, we're saying it all starts with a relationship. It's all enhanced. That's where the real sales is. That's where the opportunities lie. Yeah. And, and obviously you've done a great job with building relationships. You've started up your own podcast as well. And if you didn't have those relationships, you wouldn't be getting the guests that you are on on your podcast. You want to tell the audience about your podcast? Sure. Well, um, during COVID, I was withering away from <laughs> lack of connection and creativity. A lot of people over the years have said, Erica, when are you doing a, a, you know, some sort of a podcast? And I think that they would assume that I would do something with motherhood just because it's been mm -hmm so connected to me in terms of the website and the branding and the agency, et cetera, but I didn't want to do it about motherhood. I'm it's done. Right. And I, also someone told me that when you do a podcast, you need to do a podcast that only you can do. Because if I were to do something on motherhood, I mean, a lot of people can speak really um, uh, efficiently and knowledgeably yeah. <laughs> about motherhood now. So I wanted, to have a conversation about something that would be uniquely mine. And I thought, well, what is it that I have that most people haven't? Well, I was there at the beginning of Much Music. Mm -hmm. I was there when Canada's sort of cultural center was born. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have conversations with other people who did the same job as me? So on camera, the face of, the nation's music station and compare notes to see, did they have the same experience as me during their time at Much Music? And then once they left, because when you're so deeply entrenched in the public eye, like I was, and most mm -hmm. of those other people were, how do you reinvent? Like when right. you talk, when you talk to me, I don't know, are you talking to me as that girl that you used to have a crush on at Much Music <laughs> when you were 18? Or are you talking to me now as a peer in the world of marketing? Most people still see me as that girl from Much Music, right? which is quite limiting, actually. 
because they they can't wrap their heads around the fact that first of all I'm not 18 anymore and secondly I have skills that are um, that have nothing to do with my time at much music anyway having said that I started this podcast and I've reached out to at this point 21 of the prior hosts from much music and we've had long lingering conversations not unlike the one that you and I are having where I get to understand what their experience was like at much music what their memories were like but that's only part of the conversation and then we go into the reinvention what happened after you left how did you cope with not being in the public eye did you go back to school like how do you make a living after that how did much music imprint you and uh, people are loving loving the the podcast and i really love doing it yeah i listened to a couple of episodes as soon as i discovered it and i plan on binging through a number of them over the weekend i uh i i mean obviously it was part of my youth growing up and um you know it's it's funny that you say that if they're still thinking of you as an 18 year old but then if they are they haven't been following your career very closely because you're much <laughs> more than that um the the accomplishments that you've had over the last number of years are are significant I, i've said it in messages said at the beginning you truly are an inspiration when i watch how you can continue to reinvent and mm. be so on point with where the industry is it's it's fantastic to watch and i appreciate that i'm a big fan um what i want to say is because this is about e-commerce as well and all of the content and relationships build into e-commerce we're based on working with your clients where do you see e-commerce going i mean in this COVID environment it's exploded but where where do you see e-commerce playing a role in retail well i see it direct to consumer the direct to consumer brands are killing it mm -hmm. they're cutting out all the retailers yeah because they're building relationships directly with their audience or with their potential consumers because retailers have failed to do that and so the brands are going well we're going to actually build that relationship we all have we i'm speaking on behalf of these brands we have yep. purpose we have personality we have value we're just going to connect with our audience directly so retailers got to up their game and they they've got to start taking some of that back and putting the relationship and purpose back into their brands. Yeah, I agree. I also think though that retailers um, need to create better win-wins for themselves and the suppliers. And I, I, I look, I, I grew up in a, an organization that was very margin driven and very sales driven. And I appreciate that side of it because you don't, you don't have a business if you're not profitable. Um, not very long anyway, so I, I get that point. But if your suppliers are not profitable and they're not having uh, mm -hmm. success, then then you just kill a market and then your category starts to die anyways. So it, you have to create win-win relationships with suppliers. And I do think there's a big place <laughs> for retail. You have these, these marketplaces that uh, a, a supplier can go and do ship direct and ship to consumer through a marketplace. Um, and Amazon just announced in the US they're going to actually allow uh, those suppliers to email directly those customers, which they've never allowed before. Wow. They always kept those emails to themselves. So that's another big win for manufacturers and suppliers. But you're right, retailers do have to step themselves up. But I think, you know, like a, a home hardware where we can make ourselves different is in that customer experience. Here's how we, we talk about here's how, but really showing consumers how to have the confidence in building projects uh, and selling the dream of you can have this backyard even if you don't have the skill set we can help you get there if you do have a little bit of the skills we can help improve those skills so you can have your dream home or dream backyard or a little oasis in the backyard um, but you're right it's it's going to get harder for retailers if if they don't start developing those relationships with consumers and i don't mean just acquiring an email address at the cash because right, they, you, want, you want your email you want your receipt emailed to you that is not building a relationship um, it's what you do after that moment that's right that really matters well look at that we're still talking about relationships <laughs> and this time you added another relationship in there which is manufacturer to retailer that's mm -hmm. another relationship that you're saying needs to be nurtured because otherwise you're just going to get cut out of the equation. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So 
when I sent you a list of questions just to give you, I love the fact that we're fluid and we're, we're able to just carry a great conversation. I appreciate that so more than being, being scripted because I, I really want people to see the real you and the real me mm -hmm. versus just this, this script. But one of the questions I thought I would have some fun with was I can't imagine being a VJ or, or like, even when I listen to the radio, if a song comes on one more time, I'm going to pound my radio and just get out of the car and lose it because it gets so overplayed. Did you have that moment? Was there a song in your career where you were just like, if they make me watch this video or listen to this song again, I'm, I'm done. I'm out of here. Or were you just such a fan and it was just, it was just, you were living in that moment. The reality was that we didn't always listen to the music. Like mm -hmm. we would introduce a video and then we'd go back to our desk and prepare for the next, the next throw. Right. right. So I, you know, I guess Rick Astley was maybe right. one of them, but you know, the music wasn't there for me. Right. We were playing the music for the audience. It didn't matter what I liked or didn't like really. I mean, right. I was effusive when there was music that I loved. Obviously I would gush and I would say, this one is really special, yeah. but not everyone agreed with me. And like, I, w I wasn't a big fan of heavy metal. That isn't because heavy metal isn't good. It's because I wasn't a fan of it. Right. So, you know, it's music is really subjective. And our job was not to judge. Our job was to support and to celebrate music. That's great. I, I love the way you put that. Who were some of the mentors? Like you, you said you had the courage and to go out and say yes. That was a skill set your mom or to ask the question, your skill set your mom taught you. But after your mom, was there anyone in the industry that was just, you know what, this person just meant so much to me in my career and mm. gave me the confidence either with much music or, you know, in your, your journey with Yummy Mommy or doing your own ericam.co. Like there's got to be some, some folks that have touched you in certain ways. Um, well, JD Roberts was incredibly generous with me and he helped train me, I guess. He was a role model for me. He taught me that the number one um, skill is working hard. Right. Always be prepared. So he was a huge role model. Moses Snymer, who was the incredibly brilliant man behind Much Music, was a huge inspiration to me, uh, more in the idea of valuing an audience and understanding that broadcasting or communication is a two-way street. So that was the magic of Much Music, which was we were like a CTV or a mainstream broadcaster. They broadcast, you listen. There was no back and forth. Right. But with Much Music, it was like, we broadcast, you listen, you get back to us, we answer. RSVP, for example, live and interactive shows, for example, the open window where people can come and scream and meet the bands, Speaker's Corner. Those were all sort of interactive opportunities for the audience to be part of the show. Mm -hmm. And he also valued diversity. And I don't mean that in the now political sense. Right. He really valued the fact that we're all different and that we all have unique backgrounds and that none of us are perfect, that messy and unique is really what the world is made up of. So all the hosts on Much, we weren't the most beautiful. We were not perfect. We were a messy bunch of misfits who loved music and were passionate about it and loved to connect with people about music. Same thing when he had City TV. He didn't hire broadcasters, puppets. He yeah. hired, you know, an environmentalist to host the environmental segments. He hired a lawyer to talk about um, issues involving law, an ex-policeman to, to host the news. Like he wanted the real deal. And when I started YMC, now 15 years ago, it was a website by moms for moms. Mm -hmm. And I also curated a cast of incredibly 
interesting characters. Like, you know, Candace uh, used to be Derek's, now Candace Sampson, who has gone on to incredible things with what she said, which is a, she's now has a network of mom related content, but just finding really unique, passionate women who each had a specific niche and a great story to tell. So I basically, I didn't realize I had done it, but once I had built one YMCA, I went, whoa, I've actually taken a lot of the basis of what Much Music and City TV was built on and very, um, easily sort of built my own. And also that I think part of the success of it was because it's interactive. Mm -hmm. YMC is not about me. It's about moms supporting moms. And that's what much music was. It was fans talking to fans. Yeah. We talk about user generated content. That's how we term a lot of it now is user generated content, but it was, it was more organic than that. Um, when it wasn't a term that we use in the industry. So, it was, and that, I think that's what everyone loved about it growing up was that it was just so authentic and real. And you, you can see yourself, you can see yourself as that host. You can see like, <laughs> because you may be not the most handsome person in the world, but you know what? You didn't have to be, you could, as long as you were able to come across authentic and be real with people, then you had an opportunity to build that relationship and rapport with people. So it was great. Okay. One more question. And okay. I'm ready. Any more of your time. I'm you ready. do a lot of public speaking now. Mm -hmm. and, um, I didn't get to see if it was more corporate or if it was more about inspiring women. Um, so you can take this any direction you wanted to. If <laughs> I have a, a, a good audience of male and female, to me, it doesn't matter. But ultimately, women look up to you. And if there's anything that you can say to inspire that core of the audience that may be listening, would you like to take the opportunity to do that? Well, sure. There's, there's two big things that I like to talk about. The first one is that people who want to reinvent or get what they want in life, it, the way you do it is by doing it. Right. <laughs> like, people go, oh, but I don't know how. Well, it's small steps. It's being uh, brave to ask for what you want putting yourself in situations like this, Chris, where you were kind of nervous to ask me, but you did, and then you yeah. reap the benefits of it. So I guess what I would say to people who are listening, and I mentioned it at the top, which was hours ago, <laughs> um, to not be afraid to ask for what you want in life. Mm -hmm. And to understand that if someone says no, use it to start a relationship. Now, I would also say to your corporate colleagues that I love to get in there and do speaking engagements about the power of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. which is kind of what we were talking about, which is how do you inspire your staff, your employees to be more than just people who punch in? How do you inspire the people who work for you to feel like they're entrepreneurs, to invest emotionally in your business and help you grow it. Yeah. You see, it's all based on relationships, isn't it? Yeah. And so if anyone ever wants me to come to their their office, their you know, their or their Zoom <laughs> and have those kinds of conversations with me, I would love to talk about courageous leadership and how we need that more now than ever, especially in the world of retail as you and I have just discussed. Yeah, hundred percent. So when, when now people have listened to that comment, um, that you would love to be able to do that, how do they get a hold of you? Oh, it's so easy. Just go to ericam.com or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and just say, Hey, I just heard you on Chris Parsons podcast, Erica, you were awesome. And I'd love to talk to you. That's all you do. Sweet. You are a delight. I really appreciate our time together tonight. Um, uh, you've made you've made my day. I've just started this podcast, like I said, maybe a month ago, and um, I was really nervous about doing it. I don't consider myself a host at all, but I do. I do want to try to bring value to people in our in our network in our organization. And um, I think you know, being able to listen to you after when we post this thing, a lot of people are going to have fun with it. So thank you so much, Eric. <laughs> I really appreciate You're welcome. It. Thanks for asking me.
You've been listening to Delivering E-Commerce. It's our passion to have on leaders and suppliers in e-commerce from around the globe, setting you and your strategy up for the next level. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with Chris on LinkedIn at Chris Parsons, on YouTube at Chris Parsons Delivering E-Commerce, and on Twitch at Chris Parsons 1976. Till next time, this is Delivering E-Commerce.